Good evening, everyone. Um, wonderful to be here. Thank you, Arun. Thank you, Daval. Um, thank you, Professor Dong. Um, I want to warn you, I've had a cold. I've got a bit of coughing. Very sorry about it. I'll try not to cough. Um, we have a very esteemed panel uh, of Indian and Chinese and Hong Kong representatives. Um, so let me kick off. So we have about an hour and a half. Uh, we'll have each panelist talk for about five minutes um, about, it, about areas they work on with respect to startups in India and China. And then we'll have a conversation for about half an hour. I have a list of questions. Um, I used to be a professor, so I'm quite ha happy having a list of questions and asking tough questions. And then we'll open up to the audience towards the end. Um, so just a brief introduction to our panelists. I speak no language east of uh, India, so I apologize for the, uh, for the uh, pronunciation. We have Ren Ren here, who is an anchor. This is the first time I am moderating an anchor, so this is excellent. <laughs> Uh, who is the anchor for Phoenix Satellite TV uh, in Hong Kong and a senior consultant um, and working with an innovation, innovation group, senior club. club, senior club. Um, we have Rohan Malhotra, who is the co-founder of Investopad um, out of Delhi, based out of Delhi. Uh, we have U Chiafu, who is an entrepreneur yeah. and the chairman of the Muneng, Muneng group, group. Um, and then we have Tanuj um, Botswani, who is with iSpirit, which is a very exciting organization in Bangalore, which I'm sure you'll speak more about. And then lastly, we have Victor Vidya, who has just flown in. He landed 435, so this is dedication. <laughs> <laughs> He's the chairman of the Chinese Enterprise Institute and a managing partner of the China Equity Group. Um, so shall we? Go in order. Shall we start with you? Would you like to speak to oh, for sure, about, sure. give your uh, opening remarks? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Lena, and very nice to meet you guys. Good evening. Well, my name is Ren Ren, as introduced by Lena. I am um, from Phoenix TV, and it's my, it's my first time to Mumbai, to India, and frankly speaking, I'm very impre impressed by the modernization of Mumbai. Compared with Beijing, Hong Kong, the big cities in China, um, I can see the same vitalities here. So people striving for better life in the country, striving, striving for better development. So I kept asking myself, with so many similarities, so why not we just walk hands in hand, develop better relationships? So back to myself. Um, um, I'm from Phoenix TV. It's a, it's a Mandarin uh, media platform based in Hong Kong, um, broadcasting to uh, 136 countries and regions of the world, covering the audience of around 360 millions. So Phoenix TV is very influential in the Chinese communities of the world. Um, we take this influence very seriously, and we cautiously use influence to uh, facilitate the uh, development of China. Uh, we have covered a lot of stories about the high-tech companies, both in China and in India. We have branch in Delhi, <coughs> and my colleague is working very hard to report news in India and to help more Chinese know India better and to reduce the misunderstandings between the two countries. Honestly, we do have misunderstandings, right? the border disputes, uh, whether China is intimidating or not. And I also, I always believe that more communication, more information, less misunderstanding. So uh, that's a goal for Phoenix TV. Um, and I always believe that only, only if people benefit from the uh, relationships of the two countries could we uh, develop uh, closer bounds. So uh, how can we uh, benefit from the country's development? That's the, the other job of I do. Um, right now, I'm the senior counsel, uh, consultant for uh, Shenzhen's uh, Innovation CEO Club, the biggest 
uh, entrepreneurs platform in, in Shenzhen, or you can say northern China. And the membership takes around 30% of the Shenzhen's GDP in, 20, uh, in, in 2014, and the rate might be higher for now. Um, in the past years, we have, uh, we have uh, built up many channels between Shenzhen and other parts of China, especially those less developing provinces. And to, we, uh, we use our resources in high-tech industries to, uh, to help those provinces to uh, develop their own <coughs> industries. And our goal is to, to reduce the fortune gap uh, in, in China. And I guess that's, uh, that's what you guys do for now for in, in, in India, right? So, um, I, and I think that maybe we can, you know, we can uh, do more international communications, like uh, maybe we can develop the, the better relationship between Shenzhen and Mumbai and China and India. Um, to my perspective, Shenzhen and Mumbai are very similar. Mumbai is a center for commerce and entertainment industry, and also finance, right? A lot of financial institutions in, in Mumbai. So the, the same is true in, in Shenzhen. Shenzhen is, is well known for its manufacture, manufacturing industries in China. Um, it's also the financial center in northern China. Um, it's a center for trading, you know, stocks and securities in northern China. So, yeah, back to the beginning of my work, with, with so many similarities, so why not we develop a better, better relationships uh, to closer bounds? Uh, yeah, that's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think it's always hard going after an anchor who's so articulate, <laughs> but uh, I'll try and do my part. Uh, my name is Rohan Malotra. I run a small um, early stage venture capital fund based out of Delhi, though we have offices across the country now. And uh, my sort of, uh, you know, our focus has always been seed investing. I've worked uh, for larger and smaller firms across the world before I moved back to India about four years ago and saw an obvious opportunity. I think that uh, you know we've you know I, I have an interesting vantage point because I've not only seen uh, venture capital play out globally and across the tech ecosystem at large, but I've sort of firsthand uh, seen the the kind of insight and the kind of playbook and the kind of capital value and the kind of scale that large Chinese technology organizations have been able to bring to India. Uh, I was an investor in a company called Paytm, where Alibaba are now substantial uh, owners. Um, I'm an investor in another, in another very interesting uh, you know, commerce rocket ship company called Misho, where uh, Xiaomi are now investors. So I've had a good uh, insight into working uh, with a lot of these Chinese investors uh, across the stages of our companies. And uh, I've always been fascinated by the kind of insight they're able to bring in because of the scale at which they've been operating compared to what we've seen in India. Um, I think that we stand at a very, very interesting crossroads as far as technology in India is concerned right now because um, I'm actually seeing a big transition and a large opportunity when I talk to a lot of my Chinese counterparts of Indian companies who've, who are sort of, you know, between 50 and 100 million dollar companies who are building you know, globally unique products rather than just sort of solving for India products only and are being able to take that playbook to China. And, and, and a primary example of that is a company called Oyo Rooms, uh, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Um, Oyo is disrupting the way the conventional hospitality and hotel industry work. Um, about 12 months ago, I was speaking to the management team there um, who were sharing some insight on their experiences of having expanded their business in China. Um, 365 days later, they've gone and raised money at uh, four times the valuation of what just their India company was, just because they have an inroad in China and just because of the amount of opportunity and scale in China. So that was really an eye-opening sort of lesson for me as well. 
And uh, as we partner with more Chinese, uh, you know, capital firms, uh, more Chinese companies, uh, you know, for deeper learning in the different industries in which they've built out fascinating products, uh, I'm intrigued by trying to find a way to sort of cement and solidify these relationships and make the exchange of ideas a uh, sort of, uh, you know, a multilateral uh, forum rather than just it being uh, one-sided. Uh, so that's, that's my two cents. Great, thank you. Thank you. Hello,我的英语名字叫Patrick。我的公司叫慕蒙集团。在北京。我们公司主要是投资智能机器人。你把那个取下来。你把那个取下来。可以就是它同传。同传。你只能说你。智能机器人。我们投过的公司包括我们既投资机器人的这种基础硬件部分像这个触觉传感器这在中国应该是第一家在世界上也是这个领先的我们也投资服务机器人像现在用在教育上的在中国叫小胖机器人也是细分行业的领头羊 呃，那么在这儿呢，我想跟就给大家分享一个小故事。呃，我在在我上大学的时候，也就是2,000年初的时候，我这样可以干扰我。在我上大学的时候，2,000年初的时候，呃，当时我听别人给我讲了一个故事
，来弥补你在商业资源、在金融资源方面的短板。那这样的话，创业的成功概率才是大的。而我们呢，就是，呃，也，我们也就是忠于我们的这种模式。那在这几年呢，我们也做了很多的尝试。我们也是希望，就是说，呃，这是我第一次来印度。印度也是一个历史悠久的国家，也和中国一样，在过去几十年取得了巨大的成就。也是希望和在座的各位去分享我们的这个投资经验。从一个小企业的。Suddenly, printing、uh, a note, a very old sort of text art kind of note. If you're one of those old geeks like me,、uh, and the message there said, "Subscribe to PewDiePie." If you know who PewDiePie is, he is, as of today, the number one、uh, most subscribed channel on YouTube, the global video platform. <coughs> and、uh, he has been this way for a very, very long time. And only recently is he about to be dethroned, as his fans call him. The king is being taken over. The contender is、uh, for our Indian friends. It's a very common name, but around the world, everybody was surprised. The contender is something called T Series.、Uh, our Indian friends would know what that is, but for everybody else, it's a music production company that makes very popular Indian videos.、Uh, in terms of number of views. T series is already at 55 billion, whereas the next highest YouTube channel with the number of views are only at about 27 billion or so. So it's ahead by more than a nose. It's ahead by one and a half times. Why is this happening? This is happening because in about 2016,、uh, the prices of mobile data、uh, in India crashed. They they went from about 256 rupees a GB. To access to about less than 20 rupees a GB, and in that moment, I, I want you to focus on this because it, I think this is the theme of why an Indo-China summit takes place.、Uh, <coughs> it's because in that moment, what we would originally think was only for a certain limited class of Indians, typically urban English-speaking Indians,、uh, we showed that given the right access, given the right infrastructure.、Uh, The internet, the digital world, is going to be taken over by Indians as well.、Um, when that price of data crashed, when it came down to twenty rupees,、uh, this country consumed nine x more data than it did it over the previous year. Over the past fourteen years,、uh, about ten years, we've done fifth grown fifteen x in the amount of data consumed,、uh, and this is all mobile data. This is not broadband.、Uh, why I'm saying this is because we're a, While India and China have a lot of similarities, we should also remember the differences. We are still a country with a GDP of less than two thousand dollars USD, whereas China is close to about nine thousand USD. And therefore, the history of the Indian internet and how it grows 
the startups here will be very different from China. That is not to say that we don't have a lot to learn. In fact, the reason why I'm here, why I'm excited to be here, is because we do have a lot to learn. Um, but the scenarios are going to be a little different, and that is why it's still very exciting, and which is why I'm very excited to, that this summit is starting this relationship. Uh, we hope to learn a lot, uh, and we hope that today will be the start of this. I will leave the rest of what I had planned to say for the questions with the audience in the interactive session. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Victor Wen. Uh, let me first uh, spend uh, 30 seconds about my own background. I was uh, born and raised in China, uh, got my college degree, then went to US, got my PhD from Stanford, and stayed in the Silicon Valley working in various companies before I started my own company in Silicon Valley. Later on, I also run business in China, back and forth. Uh, for the last five, ten years, I've been focusing on uh, venture investing. Right now, I'm based in actually in Silicon Valley. Uh, I'm a funding partner of an uh, earlier stage venture fund uh, specializing on machine learning, internet, uh, healthcare. Uh, <clears throat> so I, in the last 30 years, I've been traveling back and forth between Silicon Valley and China. So I developed the perspective about the difference between uh, internet company startup between China and US. Uh, uh, I hope I have uh, some more opportunities tomorrow to offering those. But uh, what I would like to share today as an opening remark is uh, this is my first time in India. Uh, so uh, I spent last 10 days traveling in Rajasthan, all the cities, and uh, besiding tour, uh, I think, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to observe the differences. I think the economy is uh, uh, really uh, growing. I can tell because I went back to China late 90s and uh, early uh, 2000. In many of the cities, including the small city like a push car with the 30,000 people, I can see uh, India is taking off. And uh, uh, people are happy. And uh, obviously, infrastructure compared to China uh, is still you know, uh, somewhat behind. However, what most impressed me was the Rajasthan election. Since I, I, I don't know if the results is out. I, I think uh, Congress is winning, right? Uh, right now, uh, leading, at least. Leading, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. Uh, it's uh, by a big margin or something <laughs> like that. Uh, but anyway. Uh, I've seen the people in all over, uh, because the, that day, Saturday or Friday, was a, a holiday. You know, people everywhere, they're uh, gathering, congregate together, you know, uh, discussing the candidates in a, such a peaceful way. Uh, I don't know whether, you know, uh, the, the, I, I believe this uh, election is uh, very successful, transparent. I don't know whether there's uh, problems. But at least from what I can see from outside, from media, it's a, such a peaceful uh, uh, election. And this is something India is much more advanced than China. Because China today, even the village head, you couldn't do a you know, uh, really uh, transparent, fair election. And uh, although China today, uh, GDP-wise, is close to 10,000, there's many social political detentions need to be released or to be released. And so China's in the crossroad today, whether it's going left or right or front or back. Uh, so there's a tremendous challenges there uh, under you know, uh, glorious uh, cover. So I, I, I'm very highly impressed about uh, uh, India. And I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, India has a, such a great future. And uh, uh, when, when we were in Silicon Valley uh, about 10, 20 years ago, people say Silicon Valley is um, IC. But IC is not an integrated circuit. It's India and China. So I have uh, many uh, friends, uh, India friends. And uh, entirely Silicon Valley, I think the, uh, the high tech set, uh, uh, side is predominantly by uh, Chinese and Indian immigrants there. With uh, such a talent pool, that's why part of the reason that China can develop very quickly, I think uh, India also have exactly the same advantages. Yeah. 
Great, thank you. <coughs> so we have, um, I think we have at least, we've got two investors on our panel, and, uh, and then we have you who are representing <coughs> an, uh, an investor group as well, or an angel, in, in, in individual investors group. So could I ask you three, um, what's your sense of the current big thing or the current trends now? So, of course, um, Tanuj talked about the mobile phone and, and the cheap data being a game changer in India, right? And that's something we keep talking about. But in terms of the startup ecosystems in China and in India, what are the sort of two, three things that you think are the big trends right now? Do you, mm. do you want to start with? Do you As want you to start? Um, sure, yeah. Um, it's pretty simple for me, actually. Um, I think we try and overthink things in India very often. I think that uh, if you look around you, certainly India is in a phenomenal trajectory right now, right? I think that um, the kind of computing power that a, uh, a Reliance Geo smartphone has and has, has basically bought 100 million people online in the last 18 months uh, is just a phenomenal stat. These are people who are coming online for the first time in their life. Um, they consume differently from us. Uh, they think differently from us. Um, and I think that in many ways we need to ascertain what the opportunities are to be able to build for the next 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 million people as far as India is concerned. I think that you know, India has you know, the sort of, uh, the, the rung of India that has currently been using and consuming mobile phone data uh, is a globally homogenous layer. It's about 60 million people and they're used to transacting on an Amazon or consuming content via YouTube. Uh, but I think the next 100 million people that are coming online the opportunities are incredibly different uh, to, to be able to target that market. And I see it in two or three different ways. I think that uh, there's really <coughs> three big motives and morals in terms of how to look for the next big thing in India. I think that first and foremost, how do you educate 100 million people coming online for the first time? What kind of tools can you build out for them? Local languages, speech to text, vernacular, what kind of content you can push out for them? That's certainly something that really, really excites me from an investment perspective. And we've been fortunate to back a fascinating company um, which is based in Kochi, which is now across four southern states in India already and, um, and has about 350,000 students on its platform. Uh, they've seen tremendous scale very quickly. Uh, the second one is how do you make more, uh, more and more people part of India's gig economy? Uh, I think India has conventionally been a country of merchants, traders, middlemen, micro-entrepreneurs. Uh, people find their way back into transactions. Globally, technology has taken a very contrarian stance. It's always said that, how can we cut people out of transactions and bring a product directly to consumers? In India, whether you like it or not, I think that we're seeing uh, these middlemen find their way back into transactions. And rather than cut them out, I think it's very difficult to try and fight inherent behavior why don't we try and empower them and enable them with the help of technology? Similarly there, you know, we've seen an onset of phenomenal companies that are helping mom and pop shops come online for the first time. <coughs> We're finding innovative ways of distributing different types of supply, whether it's, it's fashion wear, whether it's food, uh, and sell it via uh, platforms like WhatsApp, which is really the internet in India today as we know it. And the third is, you know, I don't know how many of you, or at least you know, for the Chinese guests here, there's this Indian uh, mindset of time pass. Are you familiar with this? So time pass is essentially, you know, just sort of, you know, whiling your time away. I think many of us in this room are not too familiar with it, considering everyone's got their hands full. But uh, there is a big opportunity in uh, creating high-quality content for people to be able to consume. And that is also a really, really exciting third space. I think so that you're saying you know, having people waste their time is a big in, in a productive manner. Yeah. In a productive manner, yeah. get them to you know teach them something through it, uh, educate them, empower them financially. How can you sort of make those? How can you cre take that time that they allocate to, to to sort of time pass, and how do you make it more productive for them so that they be able to learn more? Uh, I'll say something relatively controversial here. I think that a lot of a lot of venture investors in India and a lot of people generally have said that you know the commerce waves, the distribution waves, the supply chain waves, uh, the logistics waves, you know, they're, they're all coming to an end in India. Um, I couldn't disagree more. I think that we are at a very, very interesting crossroads where we have so much more of this country's population to service and bring online for the first time. 
I think that you know, I, I started my career in the Bay Area and, and, and lived and worked there for five years for a firm. Uh, I think the kind of problems that we're solving there are just a completely different quantum. Uh, but I think that India right now still requires an awful lot uh, of heavy lifting in people building uh, what may seem like trivial or basic businesses, but are really changing the way uh, you know, the country consumes and transacts. And I think that that is really, really important for us to sort of uh, take heed of. So that's really where I see the opportunity in India. Wonderful, yeah. thank you. Um, well, I've been thinking one question <coughs> for recent years. That, um, <coughs> um, uh, what is the most important thing in the, in the, in the in innovation trends? Well, um, I can see that both China and India are pursuing innovation. We all agree that uh, innovation in the future. And, uh, and we all admit that both China and India are in the very serious transitional period, right? In the, in the, in the crossroad. But compared with India, China is getting more centralized. And um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the government has more power to allocate the, the resources. Uh, the uh, many state-run companies are responsible for um, you know, allocate the resources in which industries need more innovation, which industry need more resources. I'm not here to compare the advantage or disadvantage of uh, you know, uh, uh, what kind of what kind of method for uh, allocating resources is better with the market or the government? I'm just uh, I'm just saying that uh, when we look at the the innovation trend, we have to you know look back behind this. Who controls the money? Who who who, who controls the resources? And <laughs> which way does the resources being allocated? Thank you. I have to confess, I don't know much about uh, India's high-tech industry being the first time here. Uh, however, in China, in last, um, uh, I think uh, uh, we have to uh, recognize the fact that, that uh, the mobile internet in China is pretty much sort of a next, last wave, right? So the new wave is more like a machine learning, uh, uh, those kind of things. But, but still, uh, you know, the location-based services are still growing, like DD uh, still growing. There's a various kind of uh, location-based commerces are still growing, but pretty much the big wave is, is passed. Um, so in China today, uh, I, I think the, if you have to pick up one theme, that's AI and uh, machine learning. Uh, because I'm also investing in Silicon Valley, if I compare the two sides, uh, Chinese company in the last 20 years, all the high-tech startups are focusing on application. And uh, um, rarely, I, wouldn't, I, I, would, I would like to say probably you, couldn't, you could not find a single company who have original technology. Everybody is doing sort of a more application, even including the largest internet company Baidu copied uh, Google, you know, Alibaba copied eBay, you know, all that. Which is the right thing to do because, because uh, those entrepreneurs knew that whatever happened in the U.S. 10 years later, 5 years later will happen in China. Uh, so it come to the degree that when Groupon become uh, known, China overnight has 1,000 company uh, kind of a Groupon copies. Uh, as of today, uh, for AI, the things change a little bit. The, the reason being, internet is a 2 C business. AI, machine learning, is predominantly 2 B business. Because you have to go into uh, you know, retail sector, healthcare sector, trying to revitalize, change the sector. And uh, in that case, you couldn't really copy. Uh, for example, uh, face <coughs> recognition. China is way, way ahead of everybody in the world. Because in China, government has a such high demand to do face recognition, to control. And the, in the US, you couldn't do, you couldn't put a camera everywhere. In China today, uh, we have about 170 million cameras in the public occasion. The government plan to increase at least the three folds to 500 millions. So, so basically, given such a large data sources, 
and uh, given uh, lack of uh, sort of a privacy protection. Now I have to be fair that the government yesterday issued a new regulation to uh, control the pri uh, data privacy. Uh, this already become a big issue. People become concerned. If I go everywhere, I, my face will be recorded and uh, recognized. But in any case, the face recognition in China is already leading, way leading the world. And uh, however, on the chip level, on the algorithm level, Silicon Valley is still leading by a big margin, like uh, you know, NVIDIA, those companies. But in terms of application, I think the Chinese companies are doing very well. And uh, in terms of autonomous driving, healthcare, uh, it, all these uh, major sectors uh, applying um, uh, uh, AI technology. That's another, another implication for that is for internet, I think a lot of people here in this country use Google, Facebook, uh, in Instagram, right? And, and, but in China, <coughs> because of uh, language, culture, government uh, ideology, so uh, people cannot access Google, right? Uh, but they, by and large, uh, US internet companies pretty much dominate the world. But for AI, it's gonna be very hard. The, the, the reason being AI is a to-be business. It's very hard for US companies, Silicon Valley company, come to Bombay to work with a hospital or chain of a hospital because there's so many entry barriers. So these opportunities are going to be for local people. So next wave of technology, AI, is for local. Every country, you're going to see local company become giants. However, at the same time, uh, you cannot really go out uh, to the world because the same reason, yeah. I, you know, I think to Victor's point, um, I think the one thing that people forget in, in, in drawing parallels and similarities between India and China mm. in market opportunity, I couldn't agree more. I think there's many, many opportunities. But I think the one thing which is prudent to point out right now is that the Google of India is Google, the Facebook of India is Facebook, the WhatsApp of India is WhatsApp, the Amazon of India is Amazon, not a flip card. So you know, I think that you know, from that perspective, China has been able to cement many local businesses as considerable market lead leaders, obviously you know, due to you know, whether it's language or government or, or other barriers. Um, and I think that you know, that's why India becomes more of a world's playground from that perspective, uh, including you know, whether you look at uh, American capital, you look at Chinese capital. Um, India sort of open for business to, to everybody. While uh, there is a lot of merit in the way China have gone about building their, you know, large, uh, you know, businesses. So I think that that's sort of really, really important to point out quite early in the conversation uh, yeah. here as well. Yeah. Tish, do you want to talk a little bit about yeah. sort of uh, the data revolution and uh, the see. use of? Uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Do you want to talk a little bit about iSpirit and, and some? Uh, of the... Okay. So some of our work. So I. Uh, would like to, to a, agree with some of my panelists and then also paint a little bit of a different picture on, on how I think this will proceed. Uh, I take your point, and then on, on you have to ask the question where the money is coming from. So uh, I was also in, a, in the venture capital business for a little bit. I couldn't take it for a, too long, so I left. Um, but when I was there, I was, I was doing some soul searching right before quitting, and I went and I spoke to this uh, Really, really
packaged products. I mean, Indian still sale in land and gold. The worst things you can invest money in. Uh, Indians uh, don't have access to insurance, and most cases why people are in debt and farmers are going to suicide, etc., is because they're using loans where they should be using insurance, right? So I still think the financialization of this country is yet to happen, and that is a massive opportunity. The numbers range from the lowest estimate I've read is six hundred million dollars. The highest I've read for long standing is two billion dollars in terms of opportunities. So. Uh, that's one, and then we can go in specifically on what that unlocks is further. But to me, uh, the opportunity in finance for the bottom of the pyramid in India, rather than the middle of the pyramid in India, uh, is probably the most exciting. Great, thank you. Um, I, I've had the term innovation a few times now, and I've heard there's a lot of innovation, there's not that much innovation. So um, I think I want to hear from all of you, but let's start with Uchiafu. You talked about innovation in your opening remarks. Where is the innovation happening in China? Where do you think is that deep innovation, and where is it happening? In China, the most innovative is the artificial intelligence industry. The numbers of artificial intelligence in China are very high. 然后一个就是最大的统计口径的话，说是那么在今年整个上半年吧，可能就完成了三百多亿美金的融资，这是一个非常大的量。但是统计数据不一样啊，可能有的只是说几十亿美金。但总的来讲，在所有的行业里边，现在很多投资企业可能都想 all in AI， 就是都投这个人工智能方面的。呃，这是关于创新这一块。那另外呢，就是说，就是关于这个创业企业这块，我还想补充两个观点。一个呢，就是对所有创业企业来讲，其实都挺难的，都是这个从零到一，从无到有，以弱胜强的这么一个过程。而这些智慧呢，其实我们的历史，无论是中国的历史，还是印度的历史，我想历史上有很多这种以弱胜强的故事，所以我们得。我们不能说我们不具备什么条件，然后就不去做什么。我们只要找准一个点，那我们就能翻盘。所以，那怎么去找这个点？呃，我想说的是，我们还是可以做很多事情。比如说，像这个电商行业在中国，那之前有阿里巴巴了，大家都觉得没机会了。后来又出了腾讯，还有腾讯了，大家觉得又没机会了。后来，是吧？呃，腾讯刚才可能就他现在做拍拍哈，后来。就是投的京东，然后在京东之后，大家觉得又没机会，但最近又出了拼多多，哎，做的特别好。那这个他为什么能做的这么好？因为他是足够的了解他专注的那一类客户，我们必须得足够的了解我们专注的这个细分市场，那这样我们才有翻盘的希望。而最近的话，就是我们就是在中国在投资圈还提一些概念，比如说产业互联网等等。那那天呢，我看到一个项目，后来，哎，我对 AI 的这一块也有了深入的认识。我觉得产业互联网，其实他讲的应该是产业 AI。那怎么去理解这个概念呢？我遇到的这一家创业公司呢，他们是做装修行业的，在中国装修是一个非常大的行业，每年有大概五六万亿人民币的市场，但是市场占有率超过百分之一的企业，也就是市值每年的营业额超过五十亿的企业，基本上没有。那说明这个行业的特点的话，它是很特殊的，也有很多互联网创业的，包括很多大的资本也想去做这一块的创业，但是超过百分之一的目前没有。那这家公司他现在也想挑战这个，他是怎么做的呢？哎，我认识他的创始人，他的老板，他自己本身，哎，学美术出身，最后做设计，最后甚至也包工程，也组建自己的装修公司，干这个行业也十多年了，所以。那他对这个行业也有很多独特的观点和认识，而且业内的这些已经创业的这些比较知名的装修公司的老板都比较都觉得他很有才，所以他也想自己创业，也想成功，也想成为明星。但是当他去做的时候呢，很快发现哎，这个投资的钱就不够用了，到现在投了快两千多万人民币了。但是他确实是有这个非常独特的想法。那他的招募的队伍这些。就是 IT 团队的员工领的工资，后来都把工资又投里边
，甚至她的女员工背着她的丈夫，把钱也来投她，所以她这么坚持下来，坚持了今天，她这个 A P P 快做成了，然后也是朋友的关系找到我，哎，我觉得，就是挺有意思的。那这个意思在什么地方呢？就是。他说别人的 A P P， 那我说你的 A P P 和别人的 A P P 有什么不一样是吧？你的互联网创业有什么不一样？他别人的可能就只有两三百页，但我的页面有三千页。就他把关于整个装修行业的所有的知识点、关键点拆分、再拆分，特别细。所以那通过这样一种方式呢，很可能他能再占住新的市场啊。好 ，OK， 谢谢。Thank you, thank you very much. Um, so, so we had a sort of a perspective on. On the needs, do you need to innovate? Um, again, to um, get the um, investors' perspectives here, um, what we keep hearing in, in India, and I think this is fair, um, is that a lot of investors complain that there is very little actual deep innovation happening in India, that we have business model innovation, that we have tweaking, um, we have tinkering. But is there real innovation happening, or is that mostly happening outside of India? Um, so I want to ask Rohan that, and then I want to ask Victor, as an investor in China, you just said before that there's mostly a focus on app. But sitting from outside of China, there's, there's been all this talk about how China has gone from, say, copying models to really innovating deeply and having, having built an innovation ecosystem with, um, you know, to spare innovation uh, within the country. I mean, sitting between um, Silicon Valley and China, how would you compare those two innovation ecosystems? So, um, look, I think it's a tricky question. It's a bit of a double-edged sword, right? This is not an easy question to solve, to, to, to answer. Uh, I think, <coughs> look, India has been an open economy, um, and many global players have had the opportunity to come and set up shop here. A lot of them have, a lot of them have seen success. And the funny thing is, they've seen success for two reasons. One is because a lot of global companies are seen as aspirational, as far as Indian consumers are concerned. Secondly, in these Indian companies' quest to build themselves and model themselves on the global companies, the global companies have actually come from a really interesting vantage point, where they've been able to localize a lot faster than the Indian companies actually have. So I think that that's the wave of technology we saw up until sort of 2014, <coughs> 15. I think, you know, you know as uh, Tanuj pointed out earlier, with the sort of inception of data prices falling to where they've fallen, uh, the type of innovation is now slightly different. It's not necessarily localization only. It's actually more the idea and the mindset of building for Bharat and building for the next you know, billion people that actually are going to come online and consume. And, you know, innovation is a, is, a, is a tricky word there because there are really levels to how you're trying to innovate. You could tweak a product and you could innovate. Uh, you could reimagine the way the whole product works and turn it completely on its head and disrupt an industry and, you know, that, that counts as innovation too. But do we get um, new to the world ideas coming out of India? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I, in the last two or three years, we've seen a massive... A massive sort of opportunity in now addressing this new, you know, new market, and in doing that, we're building completely India-centric products. Uh, the last four businesses that we've invested in, there is no way for me to your point again, right? You know, some of my LPs are large global, you know, institutions, and you know, sometimes I just find myself sitting there and scratching my head as to how I'm meant to explain the business to them. But I think you know, we've been lucky. I think you know. Uh, uh, you know, hindsight is always uh, incredibly highly valued. And funnily, in many conversations with Ashish, I've had similar sort of uh, learnings where I've really been, you know, I've, I've been able to see that there is this, you know, blatantly large opportunity in front of me. And um, as an investor, I do not necessarily belong, uh, or none of us in this room, to be perfectly honest, belong to the rung of people that are coming online for the first time. We just consume in a homogenous fashion, in a globally homogenous fashion. And in doing that, honestly, I often have to unlearn an awful lot and learn an awful lot through real life and practical examples. And like I said, before you know, the, the last four businesses we've backed, 
there is no way for me to actually explain them to anybody outside of India because the, they are targeted on very, very India-centric behaviors. So we are absolutely seeing a phenomenal um, sort of opportunity in building here. And we're seeing a lot, you know, now India's technology ecosystem is, is no longer sort of, uh, you know, so young and nascent. Uh, I think the opportunity is still large, but we're seeing a lot of repeat entrepreneurs now, people that have built, scaled, uh, and sold or exited large businesses and are coming back to solve problems for the second or third time. And these people are now actually addressing a lot of what India is looking at. Obviously, fintech has been the flavor of the week, right? You know, many sort of successful repeat entrepreneurs are targeting, you know, fintech as, as problems. Some of my good friends are building fascinating fintech companies right now. Um, and a lot of these problems I don't understand on the first go because they really require that level of localization and letting yourself understand what problem existed in the first place. Great, thank you. Of course. Yeah, in, in terms of uh, China, um, like I said, uh, in the internet or mobile internet era, the, the, the innovation are more on business model application uh, <coughs> for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of which uh, uh, Tanuji uh, said, uh, 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 the investors, their bosses uh, in the U.S. In China, that's not the case. Uh, actually, many of the VC funds, the largest VC fund, the, I know all the founders, all the largest the VCs in China, uh, they actually initially also invested some uh, true technology companies, yeah. but returns terrible. So they end up, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, putting because a VC is yeah. in the in the business of a return, not to help the technology to do charity, right? So, so basically, uh, because of the return, they tend to choose a more safe bet, which is you know, China's Amazon, China's Google, right? Because US already proven the model. And also, even in the Silicon Valley, for a brand new technology, brand new business model, very rarely people dare to invest, because you don't know, right? Because you, uh, at the, at the, when, when the founder came to you, said, I have this great <coughs> idea. I can uh, you know, have a Harvard student to communicate with each other. I mean, you, you don't know what the, the business will be. So uh, some of the early successes, of course, uh, you know, they have a vision. But uh, most, I would say, most of VCs trying to shun away, even in the US. That's one of the reasons. Uh, the other is that. Uh, to uh, have a breakthrough in the fundamental technology, like a chips design. Sure. It requires a huge ecosystem. So, uh, so it's not a very suitable for startup companies, not suitable for uh, VC companies. I've seen many, many chip companies. I never invested because each of the, these companies require minimum $100 million exactly. to even have a first tape out. And uh, so it's a huge risk. Uh, Having said that, however, for AI, things changed a little bit because uh, two reasons. One is that, uh, like I said, uh, AI requires certain uh, customized solutions. You couldn't really get this solution from a global company. You have to develop it yourself. The second reason being, uh, given the US-China relationship right now in the high uh, attention, Chinese government, uh, starting maybe five, 10 years ago, uh, and starting to emphasize on semiconductor. I think the government put a <coughs> two trillion rupees for semiconductor foundation to support those. So right now in China, there, as far as I know, there are at least a dozen startup companies doing AI chips. And uh, each of them got a huge amount of uh, investing uh, money predominantly from a government fund. A private fund trying to shine away. Still, because they're still trying to, wow, it's high risk. But government, they want to put the money. And uh, those companies raised uh, hundreds of millions US dollars at the billions of dollar valuation. So things are changing. So, so basically, <coughs> the question is, are these dozen companies going to be next NVIDIA of the world, next Intel? I don't know. But I, I think it's going to be very challenging uh, for, for the reasons uh, we can share more tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. 
can I can I add to that? Sorry. Sure. Uh, very good point, though. It, that's not you know it's it's a uh, uh, when I study some history and just go back in technology a little before the mobile you know before two thousand seven era, uh, you start realizing, and there's a famous author who does this, I recommend her, Maria Mazakuto, uh, uh, Mariana Mazakuto, sorry, she, she put this thought in my head really that we've always thought of the government as the lender of last resort, and innovation happens in pockets like the valley, etc. <coughs> she goes back and traces innovation like uh, self-driving cars, really started with the DARPA challenge. DARPA is the American defense research. The internet itself, uh, ARPANET. Right again, same army research project. Basically, uh, Jeff Bezos uh, understands that uh, that the Amazon even before, and I'm talking about '94, uh, I think, when he was registering his company. Uh, he tried to register it on the same day as uh, the 20th anniversary of ARPANET. He, you can't really game that system. You put in an application, and you know how much time it will take. Uh, so he didn't get the same day, but he got the same month, January '94. 20th anniversary of the of the ARPANET, which became the internet, right? Uh, so it's it's very strange we think that innovation will come out of these private pockets when, like you said, it takes a lot of R and D sunk costs, uh, which typically only governments are in a position to do. Now in India, uh, it's a little different because you know we can't we don't have that kind of R and D capability. Uh, so going back to your point, are we seeing new to the world innovation? I think you can separate those two kinds of innovation. There is a fundamental innovation where you create something breakthrough that requires that kind of R&D, uh, etc. But there is a lot of what we call combinatorial innovation, which is you just put things together in a different way like Lego blocks and you come up with something new. And I think uh, uh, the frugality of what we can invest in, in R&D in India as of today leads us to combinatorial innovation as I suspect may have been true in China about 20 years ago before the government started investing. I do not know enough to comment but, but I suspect that once you start doing combinatorial innovation enough, you A get the confidence and B get the vision for more fundamental innovation. So that's the path I see us taking. Well, I, I think uh, uh, Tanuji brought a very important uh, point is whether government should really interfere or help or enhance the innovation. This is a, still a hot topic debate in China today. There's two school of uh, factions. One, of course, say, uh, you know, look at the Silicon Valley. US government never care or never really help to do anything. Silicon Valley grow by itself, right? Other, the other one is more like your point. Oh, the DARPA had uh, all this uh, internet. I, I think there's a misunderstanding here, which is this. Yes, DARPA and NIH put a lot of money, but they put the money into fundamental research at the university level. They never really say, internet is our country's next 20 years big business. They, nobody had such a authority or knowledge to do this. So they just uh, supporting all kinds of research, even very weird or you know, sometimes uh, very, you know, uh, a uh, high risky business. So for that part, I agree. Uh, I mean, what the Chinese government has been doing that and uh, supporting those fundamental Solar, research. For example. Yeah, however, uh, but uh, when, when things come to the commercial stage, I do not think government <laughs> should really interfere okay. or have a so-called you know, national industrial policy, which never worked, even in China. You know, the national industrial policy rarely works, waste a huge amount of money. And uh, so I'm really for that. Uh, 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 so basically, to think US supporting DAPA is the government supporting business is a wrong perception. Uh, that's, that's my opinion. And sadly, the, you know, I don't know how familiar uh, our audience are with venture capital as an industry, but most of us run funds that are timed, you know, sort of eight years, nine years, 12 years, uh, and need to return our capital with phenomenal returns to be able to raise money for subsequent funds. Now, I have seen funds, and I've worked at a fund which has been an evergreen fund, which is just open, you know, at any given point in time, and you give, a, as an investor in that fund, an LP, you give your notice and you can call capital after a certain amount of time. 
Now, I think the interesting thing that the partners there, you know, sort of told us and the vision that we had, and I think by proxy of it, we invested in some phenomenal businesses through that fund, was that we were, we were able to plan and predict for what the next two or three decades look like. Now, often what ends up happening is that things play out a lot faster and you actually end up returning money phenomenally. Um, and you know, some of the investments made through that fund were you know, SpaceX, Planet Lab, <coughs> Tesla, SolarCity, Supreme. So you know, it was a fascinating time because here we were thinking that, oh, these are great businesses for the next two decades, three decades, and they ended up returning money in seven years, eight years, nine years. Uh, yet having that mindset gave them the flexibility to be able to say that we're investing for the future, rather than a lot of us who are stuck you know, in these 10-year life cycles and saying that we can only invest for, you know, we need, to, we need to exit our companies after five years, six years, which is unfair. You're really not giving uh, you know, a company enough time to be able to see phenomenal scale. So the venture capital model is inherently broken if you want to look at it from that perspective. <coughs> Evergreen funds are fantastic, and as a, as a general partner in the fund, I would much rather be running an evergreen fund, but it's difficult to then, you know, have the, you know, to be able to get the right LPs for that as well. That that's an uphill, uphill battle in itself. Chris, we talked about startups, we talked about innovation, we talked about policy. Um, I think we need to talk a little bit about the consumers. I know you alluded to it earlier in terms of the case of India that we have this next um, billion of consumers going online. Um, who are, and this is for both the Chinese side and the Indian side, who are the consumers that the current startups are really focusing on? And what do we need to do to make sure, that are, if those startups are not focusing on the bottom of the pyramid, what do we need to do to make sure that startups are increasingly focusing on the, on, on the next um, large chunk of people who currently are not served by um, products and services? Do you, want to, do you want to start? <coughs> well, talking about uh, the consumers, I, um, well, um, I would say something from the uh, culture industry because uh, I'm working in the media and we, uh, <coughs> we produce information, you know, so our, our consumer, basically our audience, right? So we, uh, uh, so basically we have to attract their attention. Of, uh, of our audiences. So attention is very important for, for us. Uh, with the audience's attention, so we can attract advertisers. The advertisers provide you know, uh, the capitals for the, for, for the, for the media. <laughs> um, so, um, so there was a question. So uh, do we need to follow the audience interest or do we have to lead the audience in interest? Um, I think Phoenix TV's principle is that we focus more on leading the audience interest uh, because we target at higher, you know, uh, higher goals to uh, communicate China with the world. Um, so basically, we, we provide um, information product um, with a little bit higher quality compared with those local uh, media platforms. So basically, they, they focus more on the, uh, on the uh, you know, entertaining product to follow the audience interest and to attract more advertisement. Um, for Phoenix, we feel we have a more responsibility you know, to, to lead people's interest and to uh, communicate China more with, with the outside world and to let outside world know China more. Um, the disadvantage is that uh, if, an, if you are not so localized, then you will have more, you know, uh, you don't have a, the enough power to attract the local advertisement. So basically, our sponsors focus on more on the uh, state-run companies, you know, because they they have more responsibilities. And how do you see so, that broadly in the entertainment startup landscape? Do you see mm -hmm. um, do you see a focus on a certain type of consumer, or there's a type 
there's a focus across a range of consumers, a range of income <coughs> classes. Okay, so uh, uh, let's let's say the audience, you know, because for for media, our consumers' audience, yeah. we we focus on you know the uh, sort of elite uh, audience. The, the audience who has uh, who are kind of uh, policymakers, who are kind of uh, people with influence in <coughs> in China. So we influence those influential uh, people, so that they can be more uh, active in 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 the China's development. So that's that's a principle for uh, for Phoenix TV. Yeah. And, and more broadly in the startup landscape, what's your sense there mm -hmm. of the focus? Uh, of the focus of um, startups, are startups generally looking at the middle class consumer, or are mm -hmm. they looking at the low income, or higher income, or it's it's all varied. I think that all depends. What is your goal? If you want to do some startups in the media industry, uh, Phoenix is 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 very large. So it, um, I I don't think it's it's very good example for startups. Yeah. For for small startups in the in the media industry, I think you should focus on the uh, very uh, vertical uh, area, so to find your specifically your target audience, the people like for for example, you you provide information to people who are very interested in in militaries or very interested in entertainment. You, you don't want to cover all the audiences with, with, with every interest. If you want to do that, I think you might not be far from failure. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, Victor, what's your perspective on, I mean, so for example, here in India, there's a lot of talk of um, impact investing, low income consumers, um, getting, you know, whether it's creating products in regional languages to getting access to new uh, non-urban consumers or low-income consumers. Is that a conversation you have in China too, or is that something that's been and gone, or has, where, where's the focus? Uh, there are some uh, funds right now uh, focusing on impact uh, investing in China, but it's very small percentage. Uh, I don't know whether they have uh, invested in any uh, significant uh, social enterprises, uh, but uh, on the other hand, the social entrepreneurs, social enterprises are, are growing, and uh, at least that they're starting to have uh, some uh, impact fund. But uh, in terms of a total percentage, of, in terms of amount of money, is totally ignorable uh, today. Uh, so I, I would uh, totally discount the impact uh, uh, today. But uh, I hope, uh, I wish this kind of a sector will grow uh, if government permitted. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, consumers, I think in China, I, I used to run uh, China's very first uh, mobile uh, content company about 15 years ago. At a peak time, we have uh, 50 million users. And uh, I sit into many focus group. I sometimes go to our call center, pretend as a service representative talking to our customers. <coughs> so I learned a lot uh, about the Chinese consumers. Basically, uh, it's very bi bipolar. You're either serving iPhone users or Xiaomi phone users. Uh, basically, uh, there's China, China, even as of today, uh, part of the reason China, Chinese large cities are very clean is that uh, the government the system does not allow free immigrant from countryside to, to city. You have to have a, sort of a local passport or registration. And uh, so basically, about 600 million uh, uh, farmers they have to stay in their village. They cannot come to the city. So that's one of the biggest social problems today in China uh, that need to be solved, resolved. Uh, so given that kind of political backdrop, so you have a one on one hand is like a Beijing, Shanghai's uh, white collars. Either you are serving them or you are serving those people stay back in the village also, who also have a mobile phone, uh, who can spend, you know, um, maybe a hundred rupee per month on the mobile games or something. So uh, 
that's why he mentioned that the, another company called Pinduoduo, right? They, even <coughs> though the China's uh, e-commerce is already so developed, they can focus on those uh, lowest end customer. They don't care about anything else except for price. You have to be dirt cheap. Uh, so, so basically, as a internet consumer companies, uh, you have to figure out which of a bipolar you are serving. You cannot do both. Okay. Um. <coughs> Rohan Antonuch, any comments on uh, the consumer focus in India? Is it shifting? Are we moving towards uh, lower income consumers? Tanuj is the pro here, but I think that as far as I'm concerned, from a, as far as you know, my perspective is uh, looking at it, I think that, look, I think that you know, the first, this last decade of investing in India has been entirely focused on the 16 million globally homogenous Indians um, and that era is now slowly translating into what the next 100 mi million consume. Like, and you know, look, a lot of companies have been, have been wishful in saying, you know, the next billion, uh, which I think is a phenomenal long-term strategy. But I think, you know, in, in, in sort of being more practical about it, I think that uh, the, the next opportunity really lies in the next 100 million users. People are going to be building actively on top of the Reliance uh, Geo ecosystem now. They've, you know, come up with a... With, you know, what to me seems like a very, very fascinating product. Uh, people are consuming in, a, in an entirely different fashion. And uh, I think that, to Victor's point, you know, you can try, you can, you can sort of segregate India into those two, uh, you know, the sort of white collared cities and the, and, 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 and the more <coughs> rural village areas. Yet India obviously has this phenomenal rate of people moving from villages into, into the larger cities. And that actually is really where I see a lot of opportunity because these people need to be educated, they need to uh, be skilled or have some sort of skills to be able to get uh, you know, jobs that are not just you know, regular uh, you know, blue collar jobs. So I think that that makes India just a really, really interesting place to invest right now. And you know, a lot of stuff that we do, right? I mean, you know, I, I, I certainly wouldn't categorize myself uh, as an impact fund. Uh, but nor am I a conventional venture capital fund. We've been very fortunate to back companies that have, uh, b you know, been sort of phenomenal about educating the the the, the, the aspirational class about financial products. We've backed uh, companies that have made a hundred thousand female entrepreneurs over the last two years. So we've been lucky to have that kind of uh, impact and vantage point. Uh, but I think that's something that just matters to me much more personally. Um, and you know, if there's opportunity in in doing good, I think that's where we see a lot of excitement and upside too. Great, so before Tanuj gets to answer, I just want to flag that audience questions are coming up, so get ready. I hope there's a microphone in the room. Great, Tanuj, you answer and then uh, we'll yeah, so, take some so, questions. Like Rowan said, this is uh, really a pet topic of mine and uh, an ice spirit in general, and I could go on. Uh, so India is, you know, when we look at India, we say there are three Indians living it's three different countries in the same geographical space. You have India 1, which, you know, what uh, said, like Beijing, Shanghai, you come to Mumbai, you, you go to New York, you're going to find uh, some chaos still in India, but you're still going to see uh, it's mostly still there. You can get around with English, you can get around with just your mobile phone, cashlessly, <coughs> it's great. Then you have in India 2 that lives slightly away from these from these center of these cities, <coughs> in the suburbs in smaller cities peri-urban areas uh, and you have uh, in, in India the India three the farmers I mean their their situation is is probably way worse than any of us can imagine so those that block speaking from a venture capital hat they're not consumers yet they're still not you know they're not people who are <coughs> things are being built for in a traditional venture capital innovation kind of sense. Um, and Rohan covered that for the next aspirational, and it, it, I, as an investor, I really respect his view that uh, focus on that 100 million first. The billion is a great number to go pitch. It's a great number to go tell people why you need 100 million dollars. But uh, that's how every Chinese entrepreneur risks money 20 years ago. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's and, a great. And, and nothing's different here. <laughs> nothing's nothing different here. So yeah. it's a great pitch, but you're right. You know, you're going to have to uh, go step by step do that. Um, I, I would just to maybe give you a little more, add a little flavor to that, is to say that um, you know we're we're going to have to do this in in a different way. That's in India. That's all that I know. I don't know how it's different. Um, one example we keep giving is that you know instead of um, 
big large companies creating millions of jobs are going to have you need to have millions of small businesses creating <coughs> few jobs right and and that's really the way out uh, and to do that really is the work the, the big body of work that i spirit does i did not i deliberately did not want to speak about that and take attention away from the the india china relationships but a lot of what we do is to give agencies to the to the end point you know it's great that you have uh, googles and amazons who are the leaders in innovation who who create these things and they keep innovating and they keep entering adjacencies and creating sort of a conglomerates themselves uh, but india needs people at the end to be able to improve their lives in their own way because the context here is very very different it's very diverse we don't speak one language we we don't have uh, you know the different states themselves are not uh, you, know, you go to kerala and and they have a problem that their demographic dividend happened 20 years ago whereas you go to bihar it's it's completely different right uh, or the hindi belt in general the population is still booming so you can't even talk about this country as one country how, how many people can uh, use english uh, 10% to access media? roughly 10% yeah. 10% 100 million people roughly yeah. 100 million people yeah roughly 10% okay. which is and where there's so much opportunity why there's so much opportunity so, so in the vernacular content statistic by the way if mm -hmm. you uh, if as an indian randomly picked you take another indian randomly picked right. there is a less than 34% chance that this people have the same language mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right what's the current mobile uh, subscriber base uh so smartphones is at about 350 400 million but mm -hmm. uh, but cell phone density tele density we have more we're about one so we have 1.1 billion cell phone connections mm -hmm. but like people like me have three sim cards and, right, right right so that's that's not really number of U unique users unique is users is still about 900 million or so uh -huh. tele tele density but only about 350 400 million smartphone users oh, i see um, and a good chunk of these are it's not just smartphone right it's not smartphone the way you and i think smartphone maybe seven maybe 100 million are the way you and i consume smartphone the remainder 200 250 million people the internet is whatsapp and facebook yeah, that's WhatsApp. it nothing else so whatsapp is a whatsapp good measure whatsapp is about 250 million unique wow. users uh <coughs> good measure of of the true penetration of the internet hmm. whatsapp is 250 million i wonder users. what's the revenue of whatsapp in india uh i mean do you know they, they don't make money right now they're still not figure they're, out they're not, well i mean now they're going to start i mean they've been saying now forever but they've got a they finally appointed this is the first time in whatsapp's history they've appointed a head of a country outside of the us uh and uh, it's going to be a really really interesting time to see how people can monetize whatsapp now because how whatsapp can monetize whatsapp rather uh because with WeChat we've seen that oh, time and time again they've been we, you, there's nothing you can't buy or there's nothing you can't do on top of WeChat i you know i i i try and go and spend a month here in china just to sort of learn and draw parallels and see you know where how people are consuming see what opportunities look like in india man the way the ecosystem works there on top of WeChat there's nothing you can't do on top of it it's unbelievable so we've had panel questions yeah so okay let's see what they have Uh, hi uh so based on the some of the discussions that uh, we've heard would it be safe to say that you know investors would be more comfortable investing in india on a business model innovation than on a product innovation it's kind of a personal question because i'm considering investing in a product innovation company so i'm just wondering what's the future i mean can i hope that such a company can raise money in india or will be mostly around business model innovation like cash on delivery you know that's a, that's a uh, yeah you have i think rohan yes, should, should yeah, take this yeah, one yeah yeah absolutely yes i mean we're seeing a lot of fascinating product innovation right now in terms of even hardware or consumer electronics or uh or products for you know specific uh you know products for babies products for for uh for women of a certain age products for you know nutrition whatever it may be uh we're certainly seeing a lot of that in terms of both consumer products and technology products uh and i think that the time is now yeah absolutely great other questions sure. yeah uh question to the panel anybody can answer uh basically we read in the papers that you have a lot of china trying to overtake the us in technological terms so what specific areas is china working on ai is one area we have mentioned so far so what the specific areas china working on ai no what was not the with question? an area the question was that basically like china is trying to raise up on the technology cup <coughs> to get on par with the us or exceed us by 2030 uh -huh. 
that's something which we read often in the papers uh -huh. in general. So, what are the specific areas China is working on in technology which in your view is interesting? I, I think, like I said, the Chinese government was supporting number one semiconductor, right? Uh, because uh, semiconductor is huge business, not only chips, but also <laughs> semiconductor <laughs> equipment and, and uh, 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 software-related uh, ecosystem. I, I think that's a probably, I would say, number one area that Chinese government is really emphasizing. But uh, again, that's not really the focus of private uh, VC funds. Because uh, you know, because the risk involved, because the amount of money involved. Uh, obviously, Chinese government also wanted uh, to uh, uh, to have a, a investment or advancement in the new material. Uh, you know, uh, for example, quantum computing. You know, all these areas, the uh, Chinese government. Uh, some of the uh, you know, gene editing, those are advantage technologies. Fundamental, those are fundamental, those are what I call fundamental technology. It's not a product development. Yeah, Chinese has a lot of a product innovation companies, yeah. So I have a question for Rohan and Victor. So within the emerging technology space, there are two kind of startups. One, that they need funding to get to a level where they can actually deliver uh, something to their customers or the clients. Um, so they need a lot of money to kind of, you know, at least develop a product to kind of present it. Sure. The second kind of startup is they don't need the money, but they need clients to be able to validate something that they've built and really prove that what they've built is really useful for their clients. So what I'd really like to hear from you is two things. One, opportunities for these two kind of startups within your ecosystem. And number two, uh, your thoughts or advice with regards to how these startups should really go ahead. Thank you. Um, so, two very different questions, right? Uh, look, I think in terms of uh, companies that, are, uh, that need money to build a product, as far as, you know, if I just think from a pure venture perspective, for me it's all about the team's credentials to be able to build a product in that space. Are they the best team? in the market to be able to build a product in that space, and that's how it assess that opportunity. Obviously, how large the market is that they're trying to go after, but really, the primary thing is, you know, that seed investing, at least for, for me, it's really about the people I'm working with. Do they have the ability and the tenacity to be able to hang around and build something innovative in this space? I think as far as the second question is concerned, we actually see an awful lot of companies that are in that situation where they've built a phenomenal product, but they've not necessarily had the right match of either you know, hires in the company or the right kind of capital partners to be able to help uh, scale the company and take them to the right kind of enterprises. And we, you know, as investors, honestly, I, I've done a lot of that heavy lifting myself. I think that India still remains at an interesting crossroads where a lot of the companies that are solving for larger problems within an incumbent ecosystem uh, don't really know how to access the, 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 the industries that they're trying to solve for. So, you know, I have, you know, I, I, there's four portfolio companies of ours that, you know, that, that are enterprise SaaS companies. Uh, you know, one of them is an incredibly experienced entrepreneur. He's on his fourth company now. The other three are first-time <coughs> entrepreneurs. They've built, you know, a phenomenal product with basically no money or bootstrapped it or, you know, invested their own capital into it. But there was just a mismatch in terms of, uh, them being able to access their target market. Once you're able to open those doors and able to garner that, that access, um, you can really see you know, successful companies being built out as well. So I think that, but, but you know, just to your point on that question, for me, I've always preferred Indian companies who are building products here and selling them globally, because a lot of Indian corporations and institutions actually don't know how to price using this technology, and it's always underpriced. So I've seen that time and time again. So for us as a fund, we actually do not invest in any, uh, any Indian enterprise SaaS. Well, we do lots of Indian enterprise SaaS, but their target market has to be outside of India. Southeast Asia uh, is obviously a big, big opportunity. Uh, the US is a large opportunity, uh, Europe. Uh, but Indian companies in enterprise solving for Indian enterprises very, very difficult to price. That's very interesting. Yeah, China, for the last 20 years, yeah. there's not a single enterprise software company was uh, successful. I mean, there's some small one, domestic. Yeah. I yeah. mean, uh, the, the, every business successful are yeah. 2C business. So there's a sort more. of a, 
uh, rule of thumb of yeah. do not invest in two billions. That's the Chinese VCs. Uh, sadly, rule of thumb. sadly, it's very similar here. I will only ever do enterprise SaaS if it is building for the rest of the world, right. and not sadly same, building same for thing. India. To, uh, uh, to answer, I'm not sure if I understand your question. You basically you said that one company needs the money, another company needs the customer, right? How how you help and distinguish? Uh, I personally have not met uh, any startup company, either in the US or China, not needing money. So everybody needs money. Every startup needs money. Uh, and uh, to me, there's only two types of uh, uh, startups. One is they have a real customer. The other ones, they don't. Uh, for, uh, for those companies who don't have a customer, I mean, basically, regardless how great your technology is, it's not going to be a very good, uh, successful company. My, my, my own background, actually, I, I, my PhD study was uh, AI, machine learning. Uh, all my career was a high tech, very deep technology, chip design. But when I become an investor, the first thing I look is not technology. The first thing I look <coughs> is whether you have a real market yeah. or you meet some real needs. Uh, because once you identify a great market potential, you can always find technology people to develop the technology. Uh, but in the high tech industry, the founders are often technology background, engineers, you know, they, they came to me, they said, hey, I have a, this great technology. Then my question is always, where's your customer? Who do you sell to? They have never thought about those. So those companies, uh, you know, whether Either we can identify the, uh, the market for them, or generally we prefer, you know, they have thought through those questions because uh, investor cannot do this for, for them. So the market uh, customer is number one importance from investor point of view. Agreed. Yeah. Great. I think final question. Are there any more? All right. Let's uh, clap the institutions together and keep it brief. <coughs> Uh, you're keeping yourself from food. <laughs> okay, uh, so I come from a BFSI sector primarily, and uh, uh, being a startup, uh, there is always a kind of innovations <laughs> and with the high tech industry coming in, um, ease of doing business is one very important thing which is essential for us to understand from if I'm going to China, then how easy it is to do business in this BFI sector. And uh, with the new disruptive uh, technologies and everything coming in and with uh, the fear of parallel economy coming up, how does China see all these issues and how they try to solve it out? What kind of issues? Uh, the, the legal issues, the kind of... Uh, oh, you mean for star Indian startup companies going uh, yeah, who are in the China? BFSI sector, uh, what? banking and financial <laughs> services, like if I've got, got an exchange and I need to get into China and try to do trading out there. How, do, how easy it is to get into there? I really do not advise any startup companies in uh, India to go to China. Same thing that if a startup company in China, they said, oh, my market is India, I'm not going to invest in them. Because th th they're not in the stage, because <laughs> there's a, such a high entry barrier. I mean, look at the Chinese company when they come to India, Xiaomi or Huawei, whatever. They're well established. They saturate the Chinese market. They, you know, uh, startup company is really hard. You have to focus uh, your market. I mean, uh, obviously, Chinese company, I mean, for many Chinese like myself, I have not been even in India. If they came to me and said, I want to open up Indian market, that's totally bullshit. I mean, right? I mean, it's, it's impossible. You have to be very, very familiar with the market. Uh, I mean, Obviously, uh, if this particular Chinese, uh, you know, lived in India for 10 years, they went back to China, he knows certain f sector, of course, right? But in general, no. One last uh, question. Uh, do you think there's a danger um, of either India or China becoming a bit like Japan, where a lot of innovation is happening, but it's happening only for Japan? That because perhaps in either case, the entry barrier is so high, no external influence comes in, but because you're so comfortable in that entry barrier, nothing that you do goes out either. Do you think there's a danger there? And do you think that, how do you think we could potentially avoid that? Danger of what I, I don't know. The innovation being focused only 
on something that works in India or works only in China, respectively, and uh, not something that say has cap is capable of global application. Mm -hmm. uh, might might you know it becomes a little bit of a fishbowl. Let's say let's say. That. Honestly, it depends entirely on 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 time and the opportunity in your existing market, right? India still has a phenomenal opportunity. China still has phenomenal opportunity. Even though, as Victor mentioned, you know now we've seen a lot of innovation. There still are companies like Pinduoduo that are coming out and just disrupting existing market structures that you know a lot of us didn't even know existed. Uh, India right now has an awful lot of opportunity. As, a as, as far as consumer technology is concerned, we certainly do not need to look outside right now. You, if, if, you, if you must, you can at scale. Uh, you know, companies like Oyo have done it with great success, by the way. Uh, Ola as well have sort of scaled to places outside of India. Uh, but enterprise companies in India have been providing their services for generations and decades to, to global companies. India's technology backbone is Wipro, IBM, uh, Infosys. These are all companies that don't really have customers. TCS, they don't have customers in India. All the customers are large global uh, players. So I don't think India would necessarily uh, fall under that bracket. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, Depends on context you're talking about. If you're talking about startup, that's not even their concern. They have so many things keep them wake up in the middle of the night, and uh, being a global company was the last one. You know, uh, most of the startup company are in the surviving mode to have a first product shipping out the door, first customer, first uh, PO. Yeah. You know, Th that's what occupy them. So those only those company already have a very well established in the domestic, they started worrying about. Uh, then they probably have some money to innovate. In terms of uh, uh, being a globalization, I, I think that for hardware companies, much easier than software companies. The hardest one is the service and content, yeah. because those are language and la uh, culture barrier, right? Product, iPhone is iPhone, right? You can sell everywhere. That's why look at the successful Chinese globalization companies, all hardware companies. Extremely hard for Baidu, uh, 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 Tencent to come out. Alibaba, maybe, uh, but still uh, much harder than Huawei and Xiaomi. They've right. invested wisely, right? Baidu, Tencent, Alibaba have invested wisely right. in globalization, which, yeah. is, which is a great way to do it. Right, right. Great. <coughs> Thank you so much. I'm afraid we're out of time. Um, can we wrap up by one sentence each on where you expect to be in 10 years? Where, where will the startup ecosystems in China and India be in 10 years' time? <coughs> Do you want to start, Amran? Mm. Well, it's uh, one sentence. That's, uh, yeah, that's not an easy task. <clears throat> because talking about future, they will always, uh, people have always a lot of to a lot of it to say, a lot of the imagination. But if I have to summarize the uh, a, the a innovation ecosystem in in China in one sentence, I hope it could be the more flexible, more um, um, I think flexible will will, will be the essence of the the uh, future imagination of the. Uh, uh, innovation ecosystem in China, yeah, because then we will have more space for for things to grow up. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, two words really. One colossal. I think that the the opportunity is so large that we don't know. We we, we don't know how large it is yet. Uh, two is unique. I think India is and will always remain just a completely different market from anything else in the world. Yeah. So as long as we're able to cater to that uniqueness, we'll be fine. 专注于对他人，专注于对他人、对社会、对人类有益的创新，东方的智慧一定会在世界上闪耀光芒。uh, ten year actually is very short. Uh, uh, I would uh, predict in China's uh, startup ecosystem, despite of uh, uh, great efforts of trying to get into the fundamental innovation, but the majority of the innovation still will remain in business model application.
Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you to the audience for being so patient with us. Uh, I believe there.